media trends and welcome to the world transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host Stephen Gordon. Hello Stephen. Hey Phil, how are you? Well I am super fantastic. How are you my friend? Man, I am doing great. It seems like it's been forever since we've spoken and man, I'm, I'm glad to get right back into things. We, we had a kind of a big lag between our Wednesday and Friday shows. It was a one-week lag, actually. We did a Wednesday show, and then we didn't get back to it until Friday. So it was a Friday show, but it was a week late. So, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. There's a lot of great stuff to be talking about, and we're just going to jump right in. We've got a fun topic tonight because this is something that we've talked about quite a few times before, which is how the future kind of sneaks up on us, how we think that something is a long way off, and then suddenly it's the thing, right? It's, it's become <laughs> the, the technology that everyone just sort of relies on, that everyone has gotten used to. W- one of our big examples of this is we've talked about autonomous vehicles for a long time, and we have tracked how that idea has gone from far out science fiction to an accepted future scenario to something that uh, has become more or less more or less something that's expected or that is kind of creeping up on us. And in fact, that's one of our, one of our examples tonight. As we're going to talk, we're going to get into and talk a little bit about how we're closer than we think, that these technologies are actually coming along at a really surprising pace. And it's happening in a kind of a quiet, almost subtle way to the point where you just don't see the big screaming headlines around some of these things. And maybe they should get a little more attention paid to them, shouldn't they? I think so. I think so. This first one was pretty amazing to me. Driverless street sweepers. If there's any ever a time that you think, well, there there needs to be a a person behind the wheel. It's it's not just the the Uber car and not just uh, your your own personal vehicle, but certainly some of these big machines. You'd think that they're the last vehicles that you would turn over to a robot to drive, but uh, not not in this example. In Shanghai, they're giving it a try, and it looks like yeah. it's it's working pretty well. There are, when you think about it, some good reasons why this might work in a high-traffic area. Uh, uh, to, to go back to your original point, this isn't the first implementation of autonomous vehicles that you expect, right? Right. Th- this is not it. What I expect is long-distance cross-country trucks. Yeah, in, on the interstate with, like, plenty of warning lights and stuff, warning driverless trucks, but you give them plenty of room, right? Something like that. They stick strictly to the interstates, and, and then they pull over to the shoulder or something when they get close to where they need to be and a human comes in and takes it the rest of the way, right? You think something like that, right? And not, not street sweepers in the middle of a busy downtown area. Like yeah, in Shanghai. like Shanghai. I mean, can you right. imagine what the traffic yeah. is like in Shanghai? So here's reasons why maybe it's not such a bad idea, though. First off, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a really big Roomba. Right? I mean, that's the idea. It's, it's a room, but it's got to stay within lanes, though. Yeah. And it's got to <laughs> yeah. the rule for the road. There is more being asked of this Roomba than of a, of a domestic model, that's for sure, than uh, of, of, the, <laughs> of the one you keep in your house. But you know what I'm saying? There's this proof of concept for this idea of, of a robot that just goes around cleaning up. I mean, there's a specified route to follow. It's probably a very monotonous job, job I would guess, driving a street sweeper. That, that's probably not one of the funner driving jobs to have in the world. And this is just this rote kind of path that they follow. So here we go. We'll, we'll put it into a program that the self-driving street sweeper follows, and we get it taken care of that much more efficiently. Here's the other thing, which I think probably makes it effective. Shanghai. We're talking People's Republic of China here, right? So they can pretty much set the rule such that if you bump into this thing, it's your fault. The liability would work very differently in the U.S. than probably how yeah, there, there's not the this, there's not the army of lawyers. I, I would presume there's not a litigious society there either, and, and they are brightly colored. If these pictures are representative of what these vehicles look like, you could see them coming. They've got sensors up on top of them, and uh, they're bright green. So you would get to know that uh, hey, this, that's what this thing is, and uh, you could potentially watch out for them. I think so, uh, and and I think. I think the other thing that probably helps to make that work is just another idea that we've talked about around self-driving cars generally. And here's another application of it, right? These things don't have to be perfect. They just have to be roughly as safe as what's already going on in Shanghai. My understanding is there's some pretty wild and woolly stuff going on on the roads in China sometimes. So it's possible that in some ways the standards are a little more lax. In some ways the liability is a little less. So they're in a position they can try something like this out where it would might, might be harder to even give it a try in the West. At some point, the computation, the sensors, uh, all of it works together to be better 
than humans. At that point, you bring it everywhere. At some point, it, it would seem to me that uh, there'd be a liability problem having a human behind uh, the steering wheel if you could have a safer machine instead. Are you a reasonable street sweeper if you are not using the safest street sweeper you can get, which at some point is a robot? And maybe you're being unreasonable not to use them. And so even uh, even in a litigious society, uh, they eventually get here, but they don't come here first. Uh, I hope they have a good success with it and, and nobody hurt and uh, they, they prove themselves. That's, that's what we hope. We right? will know that we've actually, basically the revolution is over. We will know the revolution is over where autonomous vehicles is concerned when you start hearing that argument that it's less yeah. responsible to have a human being behind the wheel. Once once that becomes the accepted yeah. wisdom, it's done, right? We're, we're, yeah, we're, that's right. You, you've, you've, you've crossed a bridge that you will never turn, turn back to. So this is, this is an early step, but uh, a further step than I think people are expecting, and I bet we'll be seeing this somewhere in the West before too long. We're gonna, this we're gonna this be story seeing, looks like it's from our good buddy uh, Thomas Fry. It, it, uh, it is over at Impact Lab, you bet. He, he just produces a lot of good stuff. I don't know. He does. It'd be a lot harder for us to do the show if it weren't for Thomas. So once again, thanks, Thomas. <laughs> That's right. Whether he's on the show or not, he contributes. So. We've got to have him back on again soon, for sure. Yeah. Okay, now this one is in Nature, and the story is sucking carbon dioxide from air is cheaper than scientists thought. Estimated cost of geoengineering technology to fight climate change has plunged since a 2011 analysis. So this is great. Great news here. We've talked a lot about the possibility of putting some kind of geoengineering solution in place around taking CO2 out of the air, that if we really want to get serious about climate change, there's a couple of things that should be on the table that you don't hear discussed nearly often enough. One is nuclear power as a carbon neutral energy producing technology that should be seriously considered. And the other is geoengineering, is what can we do to get the carbon out? Because even if, as we've discussed many times, even if we just went to 100% carbon neutral energy tomorrow, we'd still have all the carbon we've put in. And it's not going anywhere for a long time. It's not like it starts rapidly dissipating from the atmosphere. It stays for a long time, and it will be with us for quite a while. So if it's really going to be a problem, and we really need to do something about it, we need something like this. And there's a great picture here in this article in Nature, an artist rendering showing this air contractor device, which is going to pull carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere, and reads to me like the way they set the math out here sounds like it would scale. Sounds like this would be worth doing and might be something that large companies or nation states might start exploring here in the, in the reasonably near future. Well, what do we do, Phil, with this carbon? You, uh, uh, you could produce uh, a liquid fuel from it, uh, but of course then you put the carbon right back in the atmosphere. At least then it would be carbon neutral fuel, a liquid carbon neutral fuel because you, you got it out of the atmosphere. I suppose if you really wanted to uh, get the carbon out of the atmosphere and, and, and put it away, you could sequester it in the form of something solid or something. Well, for example, carbon nanotubes, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, that in fact right. pulling, pulling CO2 from the atmosphere and turning it into carbon nanotubes, into actual physical product made of carbon, may be the perfect solution for exactly the reason you said. You get it out of the atmosphere and you've got it in a form now where uh, these diamondoid structures, that's not going back into the atmosphere anytime soon. Plus, never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> turns out those are like really useful, really handy things to have around. They solve a lot right. of different technological problems. So that one's a big win-win. And it sounds to me like once that economy is kicked in, you wouldn't want to waste your carbon uh, making a liquid fuel out of it. It's a little bit like butchering a horse. You don't do that because it's so much better to use horses for other things besides food. They're, they're so much more valuable. And and the same with the carbon. Uh, once you once you have a, a carbon nanotube economy in place. You, yeah, uh, can, I, can I just speak for a whole bunch of listeners and voice their opinion that, yes, of course you don't butcher a horse because that's mean, right? That's, uh, <laughs> I think we've got the idea that butchering a horse is mean or long after we, uh, we stopped doing it. I want everyone yeah, to know that, this is not a close call for Stephen. He's not just on the verge of butchering a horse if things <laughs> Yes, uh, absolutely. As I'm far good. as I know, Stephen has Don't. never so much as uttered a harsh word to a horse. Okay, so please. <laughs> just, it's, 
<laughs> exactly. I love horses. They're great. You know, I want to make sure we were all cool on that. I don't want anybody getting the wrong idea about where, where you are with horses. But to your point, though, it, that's right, that carbon nanotubes being one of the most valuable substances in the world, as we talked about on the show a couple weeks ago, it would probably be better to move it in that direction than to turn it into a fuel, especially since we've got all these other options for how we might – for, for how we might create fuel. But even turning it into a fuel is a pretty good idea compared to, like, say, pulling gasoline and pulling petroleum up out of the ground and making gasoline out of it because this is carb- at least carbon neutral. Right? right. If Exxon stopped drilling and did this... Yeah, because you'd yeah, at least stop putting more in, which is a good thing to do. Even if you, pardon the expression, folks, butcher the horse, you're coming out way ahead of the deal. Finally, this is, this is so great, and you've got to watch the video. We're just going to throw it out here. 3D printing of human corneas. This is just exactly what it sounds like. They've got a 3D printer, and it is producing the corneas of human eyes in a very short period of time. That's part of what's so exciting about this. They took stem cells from a healthy donor and fed them into their 3D printer using this, what they call bio-ink. I can only imagine is a some kind of protein bath i don't know what it is and they can put out a human cornea in less than 10 seconds perfectly usable human cornea there are about 15 million people worldwide who need this and now we've got 3d printers printing it out so this is like not only are we closer than we think to helping people who need corneas but how about people who need x right you name it you name the body part right. this this is actually happening now 3d printers printing out body parts that people need well you know they and this is uh, not even the first body part that has been 3D printed. They've even uh, looked at kidneys and things like that, which are obviously a lot more complicated to 3D print a kidney. And it has to be, uh, a cornea just needs to sit there and reflect, refract light correctly, whereas a kidney has to uh, is, a, is a complex organ that has to do a lot. Up to this point, what we've seen is like kind of smaller than normal kidneys and kind of experimental kidneys. They're... they're so far, one hasn't been put into a person, right? Right. But right. But these corneas look like they would work, right? I mean, this is they're the right size. Well, and, and they've right they've used them in animals. They've done animal testing, and it's not yet approved by the FDA. But there's uh, hope that it will be, and and, and fairly soon, I mean, they can be, begin human trials at some point in the near future. So. And what this will do, it will not only make it an approved technique, but it will make it a viable business. And then watch out. Here come the kidneys. Here come the lungs, here come the hearts, pituitary right. glands. You can think about restoring brain tissue. You can think about ultimately one day down the road, we've talked about this, limbs, right? It's all possible, theoretically, using a 3D printer. And you know what, Stephen? We're closer than we think. <laughs> that, that just potentially brings a lot of hope to a lot of people who need something, who right. need something in their bodies that, that isn't currently available either via transplant or via having it repaired in their body. So right. stay tuned, folks. We're closer than we think on this. We're closer than we think on geoengineering, and we're closer than we think on autonomous vehicles doing all kinds of important stuff in our lives. And that is going to do it for this edition of The World Transform. We are going to be back again Wednesday with a brand new show. Great talking with you, Stephen. Look forward to being with you all. And until next time, live to see it. Live to see it.